Uh, quick bio, um, just because I can't not talk about Jetpack because I love Jetpack so much. How many people in here use Jetpack? I love you guys. Uh, the rest of you are dead to me. Um, that's not true. I'll convert all of you. Uh, this is the Jetpack team as of like two years ago. We're actually almost like double the size now. Uh, Jetpack is a plugin that's really designed to help you end to end everything that you need to build and launch a website until you get into the nitty gritty, super specific stuff. Uh, but there's so many tools in there to help you secure your site, design your site, build your site. And if you go with the things that we've been talking about this week with like Jetpack Pro and the personal and, and the different plans that we have, uh, you can back up your site, keep it secure. You get themes and things like that to build. It's really great. Uh, being on the Jetpack team is pretty amazing too. Um, anytime that you want to talk, uh, I'm on Twitter. I joke about, about being a professor, but I was actually a professor. There's a few of my ex-students in this room. Um, that's my Twitter handle, so feel free to just reach out to me anytime you want. Uh, I wrote a few books, but you can see all this stuff later. I don't like talking about myself. So, all right. So what we're going to be talking about today are six things that we can do to improve the engagement of your website. And when I talk about engagement, what I mean is um, we want to go beyond someone arriving at your site, reading some content, and leaving. Uh, there's no brand recognition in that. People don't recognize your URL. They don't know who you are. It takes a long time for them to keep going back to the same site to recognize that they've been here before and that they want to keep reading your content. So getting them to convert into subscribers, payers, whatever it might be, is a challenging effort. So today we're going to just talk about a few things that I've done uh, in my career to help improve all of those things. And I've broken it down into six chapters. Again, we're going to have to move kind of quickly, so bear with me. I might just kind of like scream through this stuff. Um, advertising. Honda Seekong is actually a uh, sponsor, uh, but they actually do something really cool with their website. So if you are typing into Google something like new car, Civic, whatever it might be, this ad might show up. You actually arrive at this page. Uh, this would be my own only uh, uh, quarrel with this, this site, is that it has nothing to do with what I just clicked on. Uh, so for example, I clicked on a new Civic lease, and I arrive at the site, and it's uh, the generic home page. So one thing that you can do immediately when you're doing things like advertising, especially, especially for specific products or services, is make sure that you drop them right into what it is that they clicked on. But it wasn't too bad. I clicked on the model. I found their civics. And then I jump into their inventory. Again, this is pretty cool. Uh, it gets me exactly what I wanted. It would have been nicer if it literally just dropped me here or some civic-related page. But the thing I wanted to point out that they do really well is if you notice at the top of the site, the URL actually carries the, uh, the thing that you are searching for throughout your experience on the site. So once you start making decisions about what it is that you're looking for, those URL parameters actually get stuck to everything that you start clicking through. So that way you can customize each additional page. So for example, if I click through here and I get to Civic Honda, um, it's kind of hard to read. I wish I had a laser pointer. But it says right up there, model equals Civic. Now if you append that to basically everything else you click, um, you can start to build up uh, some personalization data about the people who are visiting your site so you can start to understand the types of things that they're interested in and start modifying the content on your site. And now this sounds a little bit challenging, but it's actually not that hard. So with WordPress, uh, has anybody ever written a query, like a, a search query or customized? Yeah. So adding parameters for things like the word civic, for example, is not that hard. Uh, and you can start to do these types of things over and over again. So you can have a widget on the side of the page that's always pulling up content related to whatever it is the person was searching for or using or whatever it might be. Here's a bad example of this. Jason Penny. This is their home page. It looks like a flyer, right? Like the type of thing that you would print out. Um, the funny thing about this is that JC Penny does a really bad job of remembering who you are. Now, I'm really bad at names, and this happens all the time. I'll meet somebody, and then they'll come up and talk to me afterwards, and it's really great to meet you, and they're like, no, we already met, you're a jerk. Um, but it's, it's kind of bad when it's a digital thing that does that, because there's no, there's no real excuse for it, right? I have a bad memory, but this is a computer. There's no reason for this digital experience to be bad. Um, so, you know, even though I've been to JC Penny before, 
I have to start searching for men's apparel. The funny thing is that they know what I like, um, but it takes a few clicks to get through to the types of things that I'm looking for. Specifically, uh, big and tall, flame-resistant t-shirts. I don't know why that's a thing, but it is. Um, but the thing is, if I buy that t-shirt, why is it that the next time that I come to this site, it still looks like this? Right? So this is when we get into personalization and the deep knowledge about your users. Try to keep track of what they're doing on your site. There's so many tools out there for this. There's so many things that you can do to watch their behavior and start to modify the site every time. So if I buy flame resistant shirts regularly for whatever cool stunts I'm doing, the site shouldn't be showing me like women's apparel, flip flops, and jewelry. It should be showing me men's construction work wear, boots, things like that, right? Because it knows so much more about me. And there's no real excuse for this. JCPenney's a big enough company that they can be doing this, but any WordPress website owner can start doing this right away. Any questions about chapter one? Chapter two, yeah. Yeah, so you can use cookies to uh, track that, but also if someone's purchased something off your site, they're likely to have logged in. So then you can actually start tracking them specifically uh, using their login information. Yeah. Um, there is a good cookie tool out there. It uses JavaScript cookies. I'll have to look into it and I'll get back to you. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. All right, cool. So the next thing I want to talk about is consumption. When people are consuming content on your website, um, there's so many things that you can do to improve that experience. How many people in here run websites specifically about publishing content, blogs, articles, news sites? Okay. So this whole section is for you. There are um, design elements out there uh, that use patterns that we recognize regularly. How many people know what that blue dot recognize, represents? Unread. Unread, exactly. So this is uh, you know, somebody's inbox. Um, I just screenshotted somebody's phone yesterday. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but this blue dot is really recognizable. It's something that makes your brain tick, and it's uh, kind of makes you want that thing to go away, right? You want it to go away and then you feel like you deserve a beer because you did a good job, you cleared out your inbox, whatever it might be. But then of course it shows up again the next day. Um, so adding something like an unread to uh, a blog, a news site, things like that, uh, actually opens up a, a, a huge opportunity for you to do a lot of cool things. One is, is that you know, obviously people can start to filter between the, the content that they've read and unread using just their vision, right? Like you can have some signifier that you've read this or not. But then you can get into actually starting to show content that has been unread or that hasn't been read um, or starting to push away the content that's already been read or putting it into a box so that they can share it later. Um, on top of that, Reading time is a really cool one, especially for people like me who don't have all the time in the world. I like to know how long an article is going to take. Here's a plugin that you can download uh, right for WordPress, and it tells you, it gives you the opportunity to add some meta information to your your uh, your uh, your blog, or it can actually detect the amount of words and uh, create an accurate reading time assessment. So if you look right there, this article uh, says three minutes. Another thing is save for later. Uh, this is another plugin that's available. Um, if you are kind of an implementer and you don't have development skills, plugins are great because they're just there, they're easily accessible. Um, but these are types of things that developers could build uh, you know, for you as well. The other thing about, to think about when you're talking about consumption is accessibility. Accessibility is one of the most important things you can do for your site, not only because you're making it an experience that everybody can enjoy and, and consume your content, but you're also creating uh, just better design practices. So when your content is easily legible, you're not putting you know, yellow text on a blue screen. Remember back in the day when you first started designing websites, it was cool to play with colors and things like that. Um, so if you just follow accessibility standards, you're actually just taking a step forward in creating a better design and a better website. 
Any questions about consumption? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little out of breath today. I don't know what's going on. My allergies or something. All right. Next thing. Where are your users? How many people in here run a website for a brick and mortar physical location? Cool. Yeah. All right. So I'm sure you wouldn't turn away a client if they had a brick and mortar store, right? So this is a, uh, definitely something we want to talk about. Um, here's an example I've used before. Let's imagine that you're in New York City and you're looking for a place to eat. Uh, what's the first thing you do? You go to Google. And this time I'm in the mood for Greek food, so I type that in. And this is what comes up. Um, the cool thing is that this website actually has a responsive layout. It has a pretty easy navigation. It makes it easy for me to understand uh, you know, who they are, where they are, their food, all that stuff. Uh, and I'll get into how terrible restaurant websites are in general. Uh, but how much cooler would it be if we took the time to, to identify how far away you were from that restaurant? And then we told you. So this might not make a whole lot of sense when you're like in rural Rhode Island and you're like 20 miles from something. But if you're living in uh, like a city area, downtown Boston, Providence, things like that, showing people exactly how to get to your location is cool. I mean, you can take it a step further. Um, you can give them directions and tell them how far away they are. Now, this is really important when you're getting into things like proximity and doing, um, creating a sense of urgency or creating a sense of uh, uh, superiority over your competitors. So if I'm going to walk to your restaurant, I might also pass six or seven other restaurants on the way. I want to create a connection with my user at that moment so that I can uh, keep them on the path to coming to my location. But we can take it a step further. There's no reason you can't do this type of stuff with uh, reservation APIs out there. We know that you're nine minutes away. Would you like to have a table waiting for you in 10 minutes? It's really cool, right? Like that would be such a cool way to just hit yes. And then now I have that sense of urgency. I have a sense of intention. I know that I need to get to this location. I have a time uh, sensitive reason to do that. And I have something waiting for me. The other thing that you could do, like, and this is where stuff gets endless, and I, I have like uh, scope problems where like I have ideas and they just kind of go and go and go. But you could take this a step further and have it be yes, reserve. Then it could be choose your free appetizer, and it has three pictures of three apps, and then the food could be literally waiting for them when they get there, um, creating a whole new experience, right? And it gets users in the door and using your stuff. And it doesn't have to be just for restaurants. It could be uh, for any kind of a store um, that has a physical location. Cool. Questions about GPS, locations, proximity? We're moving faster than I thought we would do, yeah? When you have that map, is that what people say directions or something like that on the Google map? Is that how you achieve that? Well, you can just pull in the Google API, like use the Google API to show your own map. And then what it would be presented with is, uh, would you like to share your location? Okay. Uh, so it makes it less creepy. People know what they're doing. Especially if you tell them why. If you give them a reason why, you can tell them, like, share your location so we can help you get here faster or something like that. They hit the button, and then you can just pop this map right up and, and help them get there. Cool. All right. Chapter four. Uh, getting them off your website, users off your website, is not always a terrible thing. And I'll tell you what. Uh, first of all, Google has been doing this kind of thing for a long time. Has anybody ever had this happen to them, where their content is just ripped out of their site, put on Google, and they never visit your page? Um, that's because Google's job isn't about bringing traffic to your website. Google's job is to answer questions for their users. Um, you just curate the content for them. Uh, so this is something that we have to get used to. Uh, it's actually expanding with things like AMP, and PWA sites and things like that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but being able to create lists like this and things like that, uh, you do end up taking up a large percentage of the search engine results page here. So while the answer to these questions may be clear, um, changing a car tire is a little bit harder than just those six steps. So I'm more likely to uh, get into that page and use that page and that content on that page because of the fact that I'm listed there. 
And if you think about it, um, vertically speaking, I have over 50% of the page view right now. So while this does seem like a little bit uh, against the grain and you don't want to necessarily be giving away your content, um, you do have a lot of real estate here to work with, which means that the people who are arriving probably have even greater attention uh, to what it is that they're looking for. Um, but when we talk about giving people quick experiences, one thing that you have to make sure that you're doing is speed testing. Uh, has anybody ever used Pingdom? It's a pretty cool app. It's free. Uh, just type in your URL. It'll give you a performance grade. It'll tell you how fast you are compared to the rest of the internet. Um, show you your page size and specific things that you can do to improve all that stuff. So if you have like a ridiculously large image on your home page, um, it'll tell you that and it'll tell you how long it took to load that image and how to specifically reduce those things. Another thing you can do to speed things up is AMP. Has everybody uh, done a Google search recently on a news item and they click it and it loads it instantly and you realize that you actually haven't left Google, you're just viewing this content on Google's site. I would do a live demo with my phone uh, if that was possible in this room, but the way it works is that Google actually takes your content and caches it inside their search engines and then never actually takes you away from the, the system. This is a free plugin that you can use right now for your site and what it would mean is that your site would load instantly uh, I'm talking like, you, as you press it, it loads, it's like it's just downloading. Um, and Google gives you the opportunity to advertise and add additional things. And they're doing a lot of really cool things with it. So t check out the AMP plugin. Facebook does the same thing with instant articles. As everybody's noticed this, like you click an article and you actually don't leave Facebook and you're reading the content and again it loads instantly. It's the same exact thing, it's another plugin that you can install for WordPress. When we talk about speed, WP Supercache is definitely something uh, that I would uh, recommend. Again, I'm a little biased because it's an automatic product, um, but it'll help you to speed up your site. And of course, can't get away without a Jetpack plug. How many people in here know what Photon is? Photon's really cool. It's a completely free image CDN. So you just flip it on and it automatically starts serving your images from another location, makes them extremely fast. But what it also does is um, resizes your images specifically for the device that you're looking for. So if you take your photo from your phone that's 2000 X pixels wide uh, and you throw it up on your site, without something like this, you're actually serving that image to everybody. So even if you're on your mobile device, um, you're downloading this whole image, even if you don't need to. This actually is what got me into uh, real-time personalization and changing things up. I have a plugin that, that allows you to do different things with mobile versus uh, with uh, desktop and things like that. And the reason was because back then there wasn't a lot out there to help you with like responsive images and things. So if you imagine someone on a bus using their data uh, and they click on your site, they have no idea that they're going to suddenly download a two megabyte image or something like that. Uh, so you're actually doing a disservice to them and you're taking away maybe like their bandwidth and maybe even costing them physical money uh, just to visit your website. So something definitely to consider. And if you're interested in speeding up your site, we talked about WordPress.tv. All these WordCamp talks are recorded and put up on this site. If you just do a quick query for faster, there's like 500 talks on how to speed up your website. So have fun with that. Um, all right, so for the funny story, um, I, I rag on re restaurant websites a lot, uh, but when we're talking about getting people in and out or quickly, a restaurant website's a perfect example because um, you know exactly what your visitors need. Like, shout it out, like, what are you looking for on a restaurant website as a consumer? Menu, Menu reservations, phone number. phone number, hours, location. location. That's it. Like, that's all you need, right? And honestly, like, and, and I should, we can just go through these, but that's what I have on there. What's on the menu, hours, all that stuff. Seriously, if you pay me five bucks, I'll build you the ugliest website, but um, it'll work for your users. And here's a good example. This is a restaurant in Warwick. <laughs> the best one. <laughs> it's good Chinese food, actually. Uh, their website hasn't changed. It says 2011, but it really hasn't changed in since like 2001. Uh, it's basically just text on a page. Uh, 
But I love the default wing style with the purple and blue. And oh yeah. Oh yeah, they didn't put any extra time into this website at all. Actually, they probably took them longer to make it look this bad than if they had just grabbed a template and thrown it up there. But here's the thing. Um, it actually does its job. I have a quick use of the menu. I have their phone number, their location. Um, <coughs> it's 2017, they don't realize that everybody should take credit cards, but that's fine, they tell me anyway. And there are their hours. The only thing that this does as a disservice is that because it's so outdated, I wonder how accurate the information is. But that's easily fixed, right? Um, and even their menu is just a list. But it's fine because <coughs> it gives me exactly what I want. Um, does anybody here work for 1149? Because <laughs> there's a great talk next door. Um, we actually had our after party here the other night, or last night, and uh, this is a perfect example of a restaurant that comes so close. So they're a responsive website, it's actually pretty, it shows me the location. Um, as you scroll down, the address is there, the hours are very clearly uh, legible. Um, many page could use a little work, but it's not terrible. Uh, and actually what happened was is that Joy and I uh, in a rare occurrence, had uh, a free morning to go for brunch. Landon, our son, was at his grandmother's, and we said, let's go find a brunch menu. And so we get to this page, and we're going through this, and meanwhile, we're on a phone, but we're laying in bed. It's not like we're out on a mobile device, and that's another misconception, is that just because someone's on their phone, it uh, doesn't mean that they're out and about, right? They could be on their couch or in their house or whatever it might be. <coughs> Apologize for that. But here I am, I click the brunch menu, and of course what happens? I download a very huge PDF without my intention. I had no idea. <laughs> so, responsive website was really good. Using a PDF uh, for your menu is bad. Trying to view the PDF on my phone was even worse. But I, I didn't give up on it. I went back and I said, well, there's all these other menus. Maybe I just clicked the wrong one. And I click the lunch menu, and sure enough, it downloads the same PDF again. Uh, so there's like seven, there's seven links for the same PDF, and that's when I decide to ask Domino's if they make a breakfast pizza. <laughs> um, so something to think about. The responsiveness is really good, um, but it's not a replacement for experience. Danny's trying to help me, because I'm choking. Um, because, for example, um, there is a, a InDesign offer published online, and then that gives a link, and then you can, you can see a huge uh, yeah. whatever. Uh, so, going back to this, it's ugly, right? It doesn't have to be ugly, but it is. Um, but this is so much easier for me on my phone. Yep, just text. Um, now here's the thing about restaurants, and they're in a bad position because they spend tons of money to have their menus designed by a print designer. They, they take a lot of time to make sure it's absolutely perfect. Then they actually spend a lot of money actually printing them up and making them look beautiful uh, for you to actually hold inside the restaurant, right? So the, the worst thing for a restaurant owner is to say to themselves, well, I have this beautiful menu, and then I'm going to make my page look like this on the website. Um, so again, it doesn't have to look like that, uh, but it also doesn't have to be a PDF. So making it a simple text table is really good. There are really great restaurant uh, plugins out there that create custom post types inside of WordPress so that you can have just simple meta information. It's like name of the food, description of the food, image of the food, price of the food. And that way it makes it super easy to update, and then you can have a really nice design layout for all that stuff. And you can break it into different categories and things like that. Um, we talked about AMP. This is an example. Uh, and we talked about instant articles. I'm not sure exactly why that's there. Uh, all right. Profiling. Profiling is super important these days because everybody is growing to uh, expect a personalized experience. How many people in here use Netflix? How many people use uh, Amazon? How many people in here had a recommendation and they used that recommendation? 
Netflix is a great example. I love Netflix because they're really innovative with the small library they have. If you think about the uh, amount of movies out there that you really want to watch, and when you're in the mood for a movie and you go to Netflix and you type it in and, and it's not available, it's kind of frustrating. But they still have millions and millions of uh, users, and that's because of the recommendations that they make. And now they actually change. Does anybody notice how they changed their rating? So it doesn't actually show you like four stars or whatever. It shows you a match to your preferences. Right? And so there's a thumbs up and a thumbs down. And uh, um, so what it does is it actually looks at other people and the things that they like and compares it to you. And then uh, it would match you up. And then if that person saw a new movie and they really liked it, they can make that recommendation for you. It's like this close to being a dating app without being a dating app. Um, but back in my astonished days, we built a tool that would recommend uh, different types of insurance for you based off decisions that you had made. And we had a really great plans for this. Uh, but the team broke up and we went on to better things. Uh, there's some of those people here right now. Um, but this was cool because what it did was, it, has anybody ever been sold, like not, you didn't go to Geico and bought insurance, like you've been sold insurance and then they upsell you on 18 different types of insurance. I mean, if you own a house, you probably need uh, homeowner's insurance, you might need flood insurance, you probably own a car at that point, so you need car insurance. Then they try to figure out if you have a boat or an RV, and then you need that kind of insurance. And it's not just as simple as just going and getting car insurance, it's, there's all these different types. So what we actually d built was a recommendation engine that would make decisions based off of things like your location. So we wouldn't recommend earthquake insurance in Rhode Island, um, but you might recommend boat insurance because there's a high percentage of people here who own boats. So we did some cool things and some things that were a little bit uh, what we call innovative. What we actually started doing is tracking people through their process of these things. Um, and we'd submit that data to ourselves before they actually hit submit. So we could actually watch for someone navigating the site or making their decisions inside this app and then pass that information off to the insurance agent. So if, for example, you said you want a quote on car insurance, but you visited the boat insurance page, we could take that, uh, that information, pass it through the form, so the insurance agent knows that while they didn't ask specifically for a boat insurance quote, um, they were interested in boat insurance. They visited the page for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, whatever it might be. Um, so when you start to build out, when you're thinking about content ar architecture on your site, and thinking about the pages that you want to create, think about ways in which you can leverage those pages to teach you about what your users are doing. Cool. Questions about profile? No. Last chapter. Making suggestions. Um, everybody loves cats. And when you have a site about cats, those people want more cats. Um, Jetpack has a really cool related post uh, feature. The cool thing about Jetpack's related post is that we use a really complex and, and innovative Elasticsearch engine to make these recommendations for you. But we also do it on our servers. So if you go to most of your hosts and you talk to them about this kind of stuff, you're going to hear them say that um, they don't really offer related posts plugins because of the fact that it's really uh, performance intensive and it takes a, uh, puts a big burden on their servers. Jetpack is actually able to reduce that by not doing any of the work on the hosting side, but actually does it on our server side and then passes the results back. And uh, everybody knows what I mean by related posts, right? But it goes beyond just uh, like a regular post. So if you wrote a post about a cat hanging from a tree and then you get recommended that cat hanging from a tree, uh, that's a good recommendation. But that's, that's just posts. And not to say that it's just posts, but that's one way of using it. But if you run an e-commerce store, how many people in here run an e-commerce store? You can use related posts for your products. So you can start to get into that world where Amazon starts making recommendations based off the things that you're viewing. You can use something like related posts to start doing that immediately. And you just flip it on and it starts working. Um, we actually saw a pretty significant increase in engagement. Uh, if you go to jetpack.com, you can read this article. And then there's another one about the Albuquerque uh, 
news, uh, the Albuquerque Journal, it's a news, uh, or like the Providence Journal of Albuquerque, for example. Uh, they have 500,000 something views a month, and they've turned on Jetpacks related posts. Um, they saw not only a 4% increase in engagement overnight, but they saw a dramatic decrease in infrastructure costs and were able to save a lot of money. So just something to think about with related posts. Um, but when we're talking about making suggestions, sometimes what can happen is you get to a point where your site gets really cluttered. Uh, so you want to take a step back. So if we clean the slate, that was easy. And we start with something really, really simple. Um, this is something I've been working on for a while, trying to make suggestions around how publishers and uh, people who run article websites and things like that can actually um, take a step away from the clutter and all the crud that goes into your website and just start fresh. So imagine this is just a post on a website. Uh, I love the idea of having single columns and the reason for that is because you can do so much with pushing the content off to the side a little bit. When we talk about engagement, one thing that you want to think about is a social networking, uh, social networking engagement. One trick I like to do is write a tweet that preemptively uh, talks about the article. That way you can actually quote it and put it right into the article. It adds content, it adds context to the whole article, but it also gives you a free follow, retweet, and star button uh, right in there, or rather now it's a heart. Uh, so now you can, you can actually promote your own social network within your article, but actually doing it with context. Same goes with things like quotes. When you start to think about the way in which people consume content on articles, uh, you really have to consider uh, the way in which they um, scan content. So when you're writing content, you want these large headlines, you want things to stand out, um, make sure these points and these notes are more than just um, solid text. Uh, so that people can quickly scan your content and things like that. And don't be afraid to overdo it with calls to action. Uh, these are insanely large social buttons, but they actually scream to you, share this content, right? Uh, and then when we get into related posts, the default for Jetpack, for example, is those three articles, the ones with the cats that you But there's another way that you can do it. You can actually start to use infinite scroll. Does everybody know what infinite scroll is? It loads the page so that you don't have to ever wait or go to another page. You can actually use infinite scroll combined with related posts to start making recommendations on the next article you should read inside of the current article you're on. So if we zoom out, the next most related article on my site would be this one. So imagine that I've never actually left the page and instead I'm just going down into the next article. And then if I spend time on it, you can update that algorithm as people go along. So then the experience that the users have, if you combine it with things like, I read that content, and you eliminate content that's been read from the related posts, you use the related post to make the decision about what should show next, then you combine that with infinite scroll, you can have an experience where people view all the content on your website, uh, in order of preference and relatability to how they arrive there without ever having to leave. And what you've essentially done is create like a one-page reading app for your blog. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. So the question, just for the camera, uh, was are heat maps still a thing? Are we still using them? What are we recommending? Uh, does everybody know what heat maps are? I can explain it, maybe? Okay. Basically, it does things like eye tracking or mouse tracking to uh, see where you're spending your time on a page, and I still definitely use them. I don't use them for things like blogging and things like that. I use them specifically for when you want return on investment. So if you have a landing page or something like that, it's really important. Um, you can do comparison heat maps with A-B tests to see uh, if the calls to action are calling you out and things like that. Uh, the one that we use, I think, is uh, Hotjar. Hotjar is cool, too, because it also adds uh, real-time survey ability. So you can ask a question and get like an NPS score or um, you know, a survey result or something right inside the page, and it just like a little thing that pops up or whatever. 
So if you're doing something that has like a checkout flow and you find that people are getting stuck on a certain page, you know, um, data is always good, but sometimes it's good to just get that anecdotal, like, ask them, what's going on? How can I help you? That'd be a great data hack feature. Yeah, <laughs> that's, not a good, that's not a bad idea, actually, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and to add to that, does anybody here do anything with live chat? Do they offer like services like live chat? Don't be afraid to add live chat to any type of flow that's having a problem. A lot of times people use live chat just to service their, to, to offer like customer service for their products or services, but there's no reason that live chat or support can't help you with a checkout flow or things like that. Question in the back? The, uh, the, yeah, this stuff? Yeah, so this is actually um, pretty simple. It's just a theme change. Uh, so what I used is just some custom CSS, and I put a class on that block quote, and basically what it is, the whole column has a certain width, and so that block quote floats left and has like a negative left uh, margin, and so it just sucks it out a little bit. Yeah, yep. I actually built something a long time ago, back when two columns were not a thing, um, so that I could like have footnotes uh, against articles, and then, so the way that worked was that we had divs, and each div would become like a separate column, and that was pretty cool, but then what that actually led into was me doing comments next to the content. And so I had my comments up along my posts and actually related to the content that they were talking about. Um, now there's a very famous like blogging feature called Medium that does that. They stole that from me. Um, but basically you can comment in line uh, on Medium. That's pretty cool too. Have you looked at Gutenberg, the, uh, the new editing tool? So the way Gutenberg's going to work, and you can download this plugin now to start playing with it, is content blocks. Um, and what you can do there is just have like a quote block or a text block or photo block, whatever you want to do. And then it becomes very easy to do that stuff. There's also um, a table out there, the Lynchman table. They have a product called Mesh. And Mesh makes it really easy for you to create uh, columns and block content as well. So when you're writing these posts and things like that, uh, Max, it works for posts too, right? Yeah, it works for post pages. Right? right, so if you really care deeply about the way that your post shows up, a product like Mesh is perfect for you because it'll allow you to do things like this very quickly. And you can literally drag and drop the columns and place things in different ways. Yeah. So any tweet has a embed feature. So like you can just uh, go to the Twitter handle and just uh, like the tweet, the tweet, and click like there's a little sharing icon, to, and it gives you the content. But if you use Jetpack, um, if you just paste the URL, it'll turn it right into that. Yeah. Um, I have a question going back to the Google Search. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I think Google Webmaster Tools might help with that, but I don't think it's as clear cut because I think Google wants to be able to change that. And that they, what they certainly don't want is for you to corrupt it and be able to say, yeah. So the other thing too is, is that like it might show up for a percentage of the audience, but not everybody. So it's very hard for you to see that as well. Yeah. But my point to that was more about don't fight it. Because I have these conversations with people and God. You know, the conversation used to be like, well, I want to have like a giant clear div over everything so you can't select my content and copy and paste it on somebody else's site or you can't scrape it or it should be an image. God, it's like it's so painful, right? And this is the next, next iteration of that is that I don't want Google taking my content and giving it to people without them coming to my site. And the reality of the situation is, is that if you want to be visible on Google, you're going to have to be subjected to that. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, on the uh, infish scroll, 
how do you do tracking uh, of page views of those articles? The, uh, the URL actually changes. So what happens is as you view this page, uh, it uses JavaScript to change the URL so it actually acts as a page view. There you go. Okay. Any other questions? No? Awesome. Thank you so much.